In this short video, we're going to learn a method for calculating the inverse of a matrix. Now I should caution you that this is really an academic exercise. Practically, there's almost never a case where you're going to explicitly calculate the inverse of a matrix to perform any kind of uh, implementation with that inverse because in almost every case uh, it's going to be far more efficient to simply solve the corresponding system of equations using a different technique from what we're doing here by hand. Nonetheless, for us, this is a very useful method. So we're going to start with a simple idea related to linear systems. If you have more than one linear system, and they have the same coefficient matrix, we can solve all of those linear systems at once using the Gauss-Jordan elimination algorithm. Let me explain what I mean here. Suppose I have two systems of equations or matrix equations here. I'm trying to solve AX1 equals B1, AX2 equals B2, I have the same coefficient matrix in each case, and these are the entries of the coefficient matrix. I have two different right-hand side vectors. So one way I could go about this is for each right-hand side vector, I could form a different augmented matrix and then reduce these augmented matrices, both of them, to reduced row echelon form and read off the solution from there. But I would be doing a lot of extra work that I don't need to do. And the reason is that the same elementary row operations, which would transform the first augmented matrix to reduced row echelon form, would be the exact same ones we would use to transform the second augmented matrix. And that's because it's the coefficient matrix that determines the elementary row operations that we need to use. And the right-hand side just comes along for the ride. And so the idea would be is put both of the right-hand sides in your augmented matrix. Perform the elementary row operations on this extra large augmented matrix with two columns now. So two right-hand side, two extra columns, and I'll be able to get the solution or read the solution after I have transformed this matrix to reduced row echelon form. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. We're going to be working with this coefficient matrix throughout the video, so let's just review the operations that we're going to perform. So we know that Really, the first thing that we'd like to do is get a positive 1 in this 1-1 one, one entry. And I already have a negative 1, so all I need to do is multiply that first row by negative 1. I'm going to replace the first row with its, or negative 1 times itself. The next thing is I want to get zeros under that leading one. So I know that this is my first leading one. I want to get zeros there. And I'll use those type 3 elementary row operations. I'll replace row 2 with row 2 added to twice row 1. And I'll replace row 3 with row 3 minus row 1. So those are the operations I'll need to perform. That gets me my zeros where I want them. And just uh, by chance, I also get this zero, and I get a one here. So I actually got uh, a lot of work done with just using those three elementary row operations. I now see that I'm going to have three leading ones. So this is already in row echelon form. But I want reduced row echelon form which means what? That means I've got to get zeros above the leading ones. 
So I start by getting zeros above the rightmost leading one. So I would have to do what? Replace row 2 with itself minus 2 times row 3. And then I can just take uh, row 1 and add it to row 3. And that will become my new row 1. So now I've got zeros above the rightmost leading one. The only thing that's left then would be to get a zero above the second leading one here. And I can just do that by taking row one and replacing it with row one plus row two. And now I've got reduced row echelon form. It is the identity matrix. And then these two columns represent my solution vectors. This is going to be my x1 solution, and this is going to be the x2 solution. Now, let's think about how we could apply this idea to find the inverse of a matrix. Well, remember that if you take a matrix A and multiply it times its inverse, you're going to get the identity matrix. So if instead of calling A inverse, writing it this way, suppose that's, that's unknown. I want to calculate A inverse. So let's go ahead and call that X. It's the unknown matrix. But again, since A times A inverse equals the identity, then my right hand side. So here I have a matrix equation where the right hand side and the unknown matrix are square matrices. And if I can solve for this unknown matrix, uh, then I will be able to find the inverse of A. So just like in our first example, I had two columns, or two right-hand sides, and two unknown vectors. If I have an n by n matrix, I'll have n right-hand sides, the n columns of the identity matrix, and n solution vectors. And each column is then going to represent a column of the inverse of A. And so how will we solve for this matrix X? Well, we'll start by forming the augmented matrix. We'll have the coefficient matrix. And then the right-hand side, remember, is the identity matrix. So we're going to have the an n by n coefficient matrix. And we're going to have n columns, which will represent our right-hand side matrix. And then we'll just transform that to uh, reduced row echelon form. And when we're done, just like we saw in our example, the reduced row echelon form of an invertible matrix must be the identity matrix. And then in place of the identity, I'm going to have the solution matrix. So I'll have X, which will be A inverse. So let's work this out in an example. We'll start with the same coefficient matrix we had before. Uh, because we'll then apply the same elementary row operations. So the first step is to form our big augmented matrix. We have the coefficient matrix here, A. And now our right-hand side is the identity matrix. And so I just want to transform this to L, uh, reduced row echelon form using elementary row operations. So it's the same operations. We did this before. I just want to get a 1 in our 1-1 uh, one, one position. So multiply the first row by negative 1. Then I want to get zeros underneath that leading one. So I'll take the same steps there to replace row 2 with row 2 plus 2 row 1, and row 3 with row 3 minus row 1. Uh, and remember, that got us all the way to 
rho echelon form. The only thing that's left is now we start with the rightmost column and work our way back. We have to get zeros above that leading one. So again, we'll just replace rho 2 with rho 2 minus twice row 3, and we'll replace row 1 with row 1 plus row 3. Now we've got the zeros above the third leading one, and the last step is to get a zero above the second leading one. Now it is in reduced row echelon form. Our coefficient matrix has been reduced to the identity matrix. Uh, so that's what has to happen if you have an invertible matrix. And then the remaining three columns must represent the solution to our AX equals I. And of course, that means that X is going to be the inverse of A. So we can just read off the inverse of A from those three columns. Now, let's review elementary row operations. And remember, we also had elementary matrices. An elementary matrix is what you got by applying that elementary row operation to the identity matrix. So there were three types of elementary row operations. The first type was just to replace a column with a non-zero multiple of itself. The second type was to, to perform a swap. And the type three is where you take a column, I'm sorry, a row, and you replace it with the sum of that same row and a multiple of a different row. And so all of those can be undone if you think about it. How would I undo replacing a row with a non-zero multiple of itself? Well, go ahead and replace it by the reciprocal. We'll take the reciprocal of the multiple times that self, because c times 1 over c would be 1, and I'd be back with the original row. If I want to do a swap and I want to undo that, we'll just do the swap again. Uh, if you do the same swap twice, then everything is back in its original location. And then for type 3, instead of adding the multiple of the other row, you want to subtract that. Because you've added it, then you subtract it, then you're back to the original row. Now if I apply those operations to the first operation, to the identity matrix, uh, I will get uh, this matrix. And this should be its inverse, um, because it undoes that operation. Of course, the reverse of an, an elementary row operation is itself another elementary row operation of the same type. So if, of course I could get the inverse by just saying, oh, let me take the identity matrix and replace row 1 with 1 over c times row 1. And there I've got the inverse of the original elementary row operation. Of course, with a swap, a swap is involutory. Remember, it's its own inverse. So there's really no change there in the elementary matrix versus the inverse elementary matrix. And then here, all we've done is change the sign on the constant C. Well, why do we care about uh, elementary matrices when we're thinking about inverses? Well, one thing that's clear is that every elementary matrix then is invertible. And its inverse is itself an elementary matrix. That's a useful fact. But even more useful is that, well, before we get to that, let's just review what elementary row uh, operations and their corresponding matrices were uh, for our example. So our first elementary row operation was to just replace row 1 with negative 1 times itself. So I get my elementary matrix. And I'm going to call it E1 because we're going to apply these elementary row operations in order, E1 through E6. There are only six operations that we needed to perform. 
And the other ones were all type 3 elementary row operations. We didn't perform any swaps. So here we have the elementary row operations and the corresponding elementary matrix. Well, why is that important? Well, because one way you can perform the elementary row operation is to perform a matrix matrix multiplication. If you multiply a matrix A on the left, by the corresponding elementary matrix, the resulting product is the same as if you had applied the elementary row operation to the matrix. So in other words, if I replace A with E times A, and it is very important that we have the order correct here. I'm multiplying on the left to modify the rows of A. So the E is on the left and A is on the right. So let's go back to our example. Our first elementary row operation was to replace the first row by negative 1 times itself. And so this was our corresponding elementary matrix. We called that E1. If I perform this matrix multiplication, then the product that I get, well, first of all, notice that I really have uh, three square matrices here. This augmented matrix really consists of two square matrices side by side. And one way I can perform this multiplication is to just take the 3 by 3 elementary matrix, multiply it times the 3 by 3 matrix which is on the left and then multiply it times the 3 by 3 matrix on the right. And so we're going to call this part here, which is the product of E1 and A, that's going to be called A sub 1. On the right, we have the product of E sub 1 and the identity, and that's just going to be E sub 1. All right, so now we have a modified augmented matrix, and that's what we're going to apply to the, or that we're going to apply the second and third uh, elementary row operations to that modified matrix in order to get, remember, what are we trying to get? Zeros below that first leading one. So we had our matrix E sub 2, which performs this elementary row operation. And now we're multiplying that times what we called A sub 1. And then this is just E sub 1. And so when I multiply this out, I can just multiply E sub 2 times A sub 1. I'm going to call that product A sub 2. And then this matrix here is, I'm going to keep it in factored form. It would be E2 times E1. And we continue the process. So this is our matrix E3, representing the third elementary row operation. We're going to multiply that by our updated or modified augmented matrix. So here I have an A sub 2. And then remember this was just the product E2 times E1. So when I multiply those out, E3 times A2, I'm going to call that A sub 3. And I'll keep this written out as the product of three elementary matrices. Now I have E3, E2, E1. And I do that for all six of my elementary row operations. So remember, now for this is going to be E sub 4, E sub 5, E sub 6, representing the last three elementary row operations that we perform. And 
this was uh, a sub 3 and this was e3 e2 e1 when I multiply that out e4 times a3 we're going to call that a sub 4 and then I'm just going to write this as e4 e3 e2 e1 and so this matrix I'll call a sub 5 it will and then on the right I'll have the product e5 times e4 times e3 times e2 times e1 and then our final matrix after I apply the last elementary row operation I'll have a sub 6 which is the same as the identity matrix the 3 by 3 identity matrix and then here I would have the product of all of the elementary matrices starting from E6 down to E1. But really, that should be A inverse. So the product of these elementary matrices in this particular order gives us A inverse. In other words, A inverse can be written as the product of elementary matrices. Let's go over that again. We started with our original augmented matrix. We wanted to apply the first elementary row operation. Well, we can do that by multiplying by the corresponding elementary matrix. And the way we do that was multiply the elementary matrix by the first 3 by 3 and then multiply it times the second 3 by 3. That gives us, well, E1 in place of the identity and then E1 times A, remember we called that A1. And then we took this updated augmented matrix, matrix or the modified augmented matrix and we multiplied that on the right by E2. Two. That's the same as applying the second elementary row operation. And again, how did we do that? Again, we multiply that 3 by 3 elementary matrix times the 3 by 3 coefficient location and then times the second 3 by 3 location. So I'll have E2 times E1 and then I just leave this as E2 times E1 and to make things simpler I call E2 times A1 A2 and then I just repeat this process for all six elementary row operations which were required to bring this to reduced row echelon form and in reduced row echelon form means the first 3 by 3 matrix is going to be the identity matrix and that means that the second 3 by 3 matrix is A inverse. So in other words, A inverse can be found by multiplying out these elementary row operations or elementary matrices. Now, as an aside, I'd like to go back and look at these elementary matrices. If you'll notice the first three have something in common and the thing that the first, I'm sorry this is the second three, let me go back to the first three. The first three have something in common and the first three have the upper triangular meaning the entries above the main diagonal they're all zero these are all what we would call 
lower triangular matrices. We'll talk more about these in a later section, but it's nice to talk about it now. It's our first time that we've encountered this idea. Lower triangular mean is only in the lower triangle do we see non-zero entries above the main diagonal. So in the upper right triangle, it's only zeros. And if I look at the last three elementary operations, well, it's just the opposite. Everything in the lower part, lower left, is zero, and it's only the upper portion of the matrix, the upper right above the main diagonal, which is non-zero. And so we call those upper triangular matrices. Well, why are we talking about that? Well, get back to this. We said that uh, the first three, let's go back, right? The first three were lower triangular. And the last three are upper triangular. So this is going to be an upper triangular matrix, and this is a lower triangular matrix. Okay, well, that's kind of interesting. We've got this descending order. And in order to, to get an even more interesting result, we need the following theorem. And it just says that if you have two invertible matrices, then the product is invertible if and only if both A and B are invertible. And moreover, the formula for the inverse of the product is the product of the inverse, but in opposite order. Uh, and that should make sense because why? We need to have that AB inverse times AB has to equal the identity. And so AB inverse, well, I need to have A multiplied times A inverse. And since A inverse times A is the identity matrix, of course, that would be the same as taking B inverse times IB. But I times any matrix just gives you that matrix back again. So that would be the same as B inverse times B. And since B is invertible, that would give me the identity matrix. So. It makes sense that we have to change the order here when we're finding the inverse of the product. We can prove this um, in a later section, but we're going to accept it as a fact. Certainly, the, the fact that if A and B are invertible now, by, since we have a formula, uh, we can definitely show that uh, the product is also invertible. And why is that important? Well, that means that since I have a inverse written as the product of elementary matrices, I could take the inverse of both sides of this equation. The inverse of A inverse is just going to be A. And if I want to write the inverse of a product, then I'm going to get the product of the inverses, but in the opposite order. So I'm going to have starting with E1 inverse times E2 inverse, then E3 inverse, E4 inverse, E5 inverse, 
and then finally multiply times e6 inverse. So I can also write A as the product of elementary matrices. So since the inverse of A inverse is A, that means I could write A as the inverse of that product, which I just showed, but I have to say it's the product of the inverse in the opposite order. So again, why is this important? Why are we spending so much time talking about that? Well, remember that the E1, E2, and E3 were all lower triangular, and this is upper triangular. So we could multiply these out. We'll learn that their inverses are also going to be lower triangular, and the inverse of an upper triangular matrix is also upper triangular. And so instead of solving, suppose that I have a coefficient matrix, and I need to solve 10,000 linear systems with 10,000 different right-hand sides. Well, we just saw that we could write A as the product of a lower triangular matrix times a upper triangular matrix. This is called by the clever name of the LU factorization. You can factor the matrix A as the product of two matrices, one which is lower triangular and one is upper triangular. Well, why is that important? Well, because then you can solve this system of equations by solving two uh, very efficient systems of equations, because if you have an upper triangular mat coefficient matrix or a lower triangle coefficient matrix, it's very easy to solve. So what you do is you just make a change of variables. You say that u times x is the vector y. And then we're going to solve ly equals b. And then we do a solve for x, ux equals y. And these systems can be performed by just using substitution. Here you use forward substitution because you'll solve for the first component of y and then you work your way down to the nth component of y. Here we'll use backward substitution because we're going to start with the substitution. We'll start with the nth component of x and work our way back to the first component of x. And together this is called forward-backward substitution, or just f, b, s. So this comes from the fact that if you have an invertible matrix that you can write it as the product of elementary matrices. The first half are all going to be lower triangular, and the second half will all be upper triangular. So if you store the entries of those matrices in an efficient way, then you can solve any linear system and recycle those elementary matrices. So that's just a little practical application there.
uh, and it also has some theoretical implications that we'll talk about in later videos.